Hello. Uh, welcome uh, to this event on the, what was the new Bauhaus. Um, and this is our last, uh, actually, event in Shapeshift of 2019. Uh, Shapeshift Design at the Neue Tech has been a design festival presented at IIT by the College of Architecture and the Institute of Design together. Uh, the, the new dean of the College of Architecture is here as well, Reid Krolov. Reed from And I am Dennis Weil, and I'm the Dean of the Institute of Design. We are happy to welcome you here on the Mies campus, and I'm also very happy to announce that tonight we are breaking 1,000 attendants at the Shapeshift Festival, a festival that was going on for 10 days, and we are just breaking 1,000 people with all of you here. So this year, we celebrate, we're using Shapeshift to celebrate uh, the Bauhaus centenary. But we want to use this platform of Shapeshift and design at Illinois Tech uh, beyond our Bauhaus heritage. Uh, we want to focus on Chicago and Illinois Tech as partners is reimagining imagining the urban environment of the 21st century. Through so our work today, both the College of Architecture and the Institute of Design, we are addressing the key uh, challenges of our city to make it more equitable and sustainable with equitable and sustainable long-term solutions. And the plan of Reed and myself is that we actually will, now that the Institute of Design moved back to the main campus just one year ago, that we will continue to extend our collaboration between what I like to call the built environment and the lift environment. The combination makes actually uh, better lives and better buildings. Uh, the event tonight has been underwritten by the Nathan family, who we all have here, in honor of Walter Nathan, an IIT alum and a longtime board member of the Institute of Design and a fan of the Bauhaus, and we'll hear after the screening more from the Nathan family. Uh, we end the festival tonight with the story of the beginning of the Institute of Design, one of the two Bauhaus-based schools at IIT, next to Mies College of Architecture. This story is not told by ID, but it's told by Open Docs, a film production company based in New York that explores and documents the world around us through film and tells us unique stories and offer new perspectives at the intersection of arts, science, nature, and politics. I'm excited to ask to the stage two members from the Open Docs team, Peter Ringbaum and Ashley Lukasik. Peter Ringbaum is the producer of the new Bauhaus documentary. Please come up <laughs> so they know who you are. Um, uh, Peter Ringbaum is the uh, producer of the new Bauhaus documentary. He has many films to his credits. His debut feature documentary, The Russian Winter, premiered at the Tribeca Film Festival in 2012. His follow-up, Shield and Spear, premiered at the Toronto Hot Dogs in 2014 and won the Silver Prize at UK's Passion for Freedom Awards. Peter's films have also been screened at IDFA, the Sheffield Dog Fest, Film Society of Lincoln Center, BAM, the Hammer Museum, Miami Art Basel, and the International Film Festivals in Moscow, Cold Place, Gothenburg, and other Cold Place, Durban, and Stockholm. All Cold Places. Peter is, <laughs> no, Durban, no. Uh, he has been a film independent fast track fellow at the Gotland Film Lab resident at the Ingmar Bergman Estate, a midpoint feature launch participant at the Bellini Talent. It is also my pleasure to introduce Ashley Lukasik. He's the head of the partnership and new business at Open Docs, the parent at Open, Bo Open, Bo Open Box, which is the parent company of Open Docs. I'm not the first one probably to confuse this. And in that role is heavily involved in the promotion and the launch of the film. However, Ashley's contribution goes much deeper. Ashley was the catalyst of the idea of producing a documentary about the new Bauhaus in 2016 when she was working at ID and led the planning for the commemoration of both ID's 80th in 2017 and the centenary of the Bauhaus in 2019. It was her that created the idea, pushed the idea forward, got Open Docs engaged as the lead, and together with John Lankford, who couldn't be here tonight, approached the angel investments for the development of the treatment. We at ID are so glad that the story of our founder, Moholy Nash, is finally being told with a film. Who he was, what motivated him, 
and the outsized impact on design in the U.S. and in Chicago he and the school he has founded have had. Thank you, Open Docs, and take it away from here. Thank you, Dennis. What are we doing? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you for um, inviting us, and thank you most of, most of all for helping us making this project. Um, I want to recognize the Nathan family, who were one of our first contributors to the project. And, um, Walter Nathan is the co-executive producer on this film. Um, the new Bauhaus, I'm sorry, I'm, I have a, getting over a cold, so I'm, I have a cough drop in my mouth. Not good timing, but it's there. Um, the new Bauhaus, this film, uh, we started around 20, end of 2016, which is quite fortuitous because that was when the Mahoudinaj future present retrospective was happening. So there was, this was sort of a, a, a fortuitous timing in the work. So I saw that show at the same time as we got connected with Institute of Design, and then we were able to, to actually start filming as the show was still up here at the Art Institute and also at LACMA. We also got um, someone from LACMA, this is the LA County Museum of Art, that, uh, that showed the, the, fil the exhibit, um, that was the last stop of that exhibit, and we got one of, someone from LACMA involved in the project, Aaron Wright, who became a producer on this, this film. So that time, the timing was really fortuitous also, because this year is the 100th anniversary of the founding of the Bauhaus, as you all know. Um, so we had a, a, a clear deadline in the works. We needed to get this film done this year, and we did. It will premiere October 16th as the opening film for the Architecture Design Film Festival in New York. And then October 17th, as the opening film for the architecture pro program at the Chicago International Film Festival. We have two screenings in Chicago um, of the full film on the 17th. And then on the 18th at AMC. Yeah? Is that what it is? MCA, MCA sorry. MCA, Chicago. Um, so, tonight we are going to look at the first 15 minutes of the film. It's you're getting a sneak peek of it. It's actually not the finished product, product because at the moment it's being, um, we're doing the sound mix and all the color work in LA. So you'll be watching something that is pre-sound mix and pre-color, but it still looks okay and it still um, gives you an idea of what the full film will be like. So, okay. Ashley? It's great to be here and I hope you guys hey. enjoy it. So. Just the, just the beginning, we hope that you come see it at the Chicago Film Festival on the 17th and 18th of October. Um, I think it's really fitting to be here tonight sharing this sort of sneak preview of the new Bauhaus with you on an evening um, when we also celebrate Walter Nathan. Um, because Walter Nathan, like the subject of our film, The Holy Nage, was a creative entrepreneur who, having fled Nazi Germany as a young man, built his empire here in the fertile ground of Chicago. And Walter was a friend of the school for many, many years. He was a, a member of the Board of Trustees for the Institute of Design, a graduate from IIT, and an, an admirer of the Bauhaus. Um, and I also considered Walter a dear friend as well as supporter of this project. In fact, this project would not have been made without the early enthusiasm and support of Walter Nathan and Anne Nathan, his wife, who's here tonight. So I just want to acknowledge Anne and Walter and Anne's four children who are also here tonight, Richard, Nina, Betsy, and Susan. And I believe Nina and Anne wanted to say a few words. I'm really honored to, to think that I'm even here in view of all this lovely crowd and what and and the, the love that Walter put into this 
this film. This film. I'm Ann Nathan. I'm Walter's wife. I'm really sorry that he's not here. So we'll save it for another time when he's, I hope, here. Okay. Anything else? That's it? No, you won't. Okay. Should I put it up here? Um, thank you so much. I'm Nina Nathan, um, Anne's daughter and Walter's daughter. On behalf of our parents, Anne and Walter Nathan, the Nathan family is so proud to support the Open Docs film, The New Bauhaus. Walter passed away in November, so he never saw the finished product. But Anne and my siblings who are here tonight, Susan, Richard, Betsy, and some representative grandchildren as well, are thrilled to be here to celebrate this wonderful accomplishment and congratulate all involved. Walter's enthusiasm for the new Bauhaus film was very clear to us. He was an alum, as you've heard, and trustee of IIT and a board member of the Institute of Design. Thus, a film celebrating not only the founder of what would become ID, but as the film notes, one of the most versatile artists of the 20th century certainly found its way to Walter's heart. It is without doubt that Walter also felt an affinity to Maholi's story, as Ashley suggested. Like Maholi, a Jewish immigrant, Walter also fled Nazi Germany, landing in Chicago in 1938, just one year after Maholi. The Aryanization of the Nathan family shoe factory in Frankfurt forced the family to start anew in America. Maholi, too, having seen the shuttering of the Bauhaus school, kept the spirit alive by eventually starting the new Bauhaus in Chicago. With a degree from IIT in mechanical engineering, Walter went on to start a manufacturing business RTC Industries, which is still alive today with our brother Richard, which uh, over time became increasingly more and more design-oriented. In addition, Walter and Anne developed a love of the fine arts, with Anne eventually becoming a highly reputed gallerist in Chicago's River North area. Walter's professional path and growing interest in industrial design and the arts eventually drew him back to his alma mater, where he became a trustee and board member. Walter's love of IIT, which afforded him opportunity and success in his newly adopted country, grew stronger over the years as he was inspired by so many of the amazing administrators, professors, faculty members, and the students that he continued to meet over time, until, in fact, he was 95 years old. We imagine that his and Anne's support of the new Bauhaus film came as a gesture to show his very, very deep respect and admiration for a school and a city that he loved. Thank you so much. It's, it's true. Petter and I had an opportunity to have lunch with Walter, I think two or three weeks before his passing, and he was like, hurry up and make this project. <laughs> Let's get it done. So he, um, he was involved and excited about it till the end of his life. Um, I'd love to call up now Vicki and Todd as well. So in addition to my colleague and fellow producer, Petter Ringbaum, who's also the cinematographer um, of the film, I also wanted to introduce our other panelists, Vicki Matranga and Todd Cook. Um, Todd Cook is a graduate student here at the Institute of Design. Prior to being a, becoming a student here, um, Todd worked for Design Within Reach and Knoll, 
Um, and he's also responsible for the research and curation of an exhibit that you can see at the top of the steps here after our panel is, has concluded um, the founding of an American Bauhaus. So definitely check that out. Todd has also published numerous um, articles on American modernism and interviewed thought leaders on the topic. We have Vicki Matranga, who is a historian and an expert on Chicago industrial design. Um, she has written and lectured on this topic at endless, numerous um, conferences and in publications. Vicki most recently contributed to the Art Design Chicago Initiative, the Art Deco Chicago Book, the Modern by Design Exhibition, and the list goes on and on. She is also featured in the film. So thank you, Vicki, for being here tonight. Um, as Dennis mentioned, I have been involved in this project since really it was just a seedling of an idea. I think, you know, we didn't know that we were going to make a film when we started talking about what we would do for the Bauhaus Centenary. Um, and it's really great to be here with the 100th anniversary of the Bauhaus happening this year with a nearly finished film ready to reveal to the public. And um, one of the things that I found really interesting in the process of, of making the film is that even though I was steeped you know, in sort of human-centered design and strategy language um, during the eight years that I was here at the Institute of Design, there was so much to uncover and learn in the process of, of making the film. And much of it seemed to come from scholars and other disciplines kind of adjacent to sort of design as we know it and talk about it at ID. Um, and so I thought we would start by just asking Vicki if you could kind of paint a picture for us of what was happening in Chicago um, that sort of led to the new Bauhaus having the opportunity to take root. This on? Um, now, yes, okay. It's, it's on, I think. Hello? Yes. Uh, well, that's a pretty big question. So there have been quite a few books written about that. And so I guess this might be the place to plug the Art Deco Chicago book that came out last year. Um, we start the book with Frank Lloyd Wright um, and talk about modernism and Art Deco as a, a joint kind of concept with 1915. So those who know Chicago, you know, we put on the biggest show on earth in 1893 with the World's Columbian Exposition <coughs> to show that we were really here and to show uh, to the world there was culture in Chicago in many ways. Chicago is known for its architecture, of course, and many enlightened patrons like the Glessners who built Glessner House were involved in many cultural affairs here. It was a big center for arts and crafts. Frank Lloyd Wright, of course, was very important. So um, a lot was going on here in the teens and 20s as various people in the in the business and art worlds were trying to blend art with industry. Um, it was a big movement uh, across the country with art museums. The Met Museum and, and the uh, um, Art Institute, Toledo Museum, had art schools um, long before uh, Holy came to town. And so what the movie left out, the little clip we've seen here, is that there was this group called the Arts and, uh, Association of Arts and Industries, which in fact was formed in 1922 by a group of business people in Chicago who wanted to join art with industry. And they sponsored lectures and events and fundraised to start a school. And they gave money to the Art Institute to do that in 1925. And so Alfonso Ianelli was teaching industrial arts and started what was the industrial design department at the Art Institute in 1927. And people were already graduating with degrees in industrial design from the SAIC in 1930, 32, 34. So they were already working in industry by the time Maholi came to town. The, the Sears Roebuck Company started in, uh, a design department in 34. Montgomery Wards be, before them in 1932. Students from, who had graduated in industrial design were working at both of those places and others, other manufacturers in town. So the, it was fertile ground in 1937. And at the same time, the University of Illinois at Urbana started its School of Industrial Design, also in 1937. So I think as the film just showed us a glimpse of what Germany was like and what was happening in Europe, I think it, we really have to understand it was really a, a critical moment in world culture that brought all these emigres from 
Germany and other countries in Europe who are being ravaged by war. And the fact that they landed in Chicago for various personal reasons and other reasons, he was invited here um, by the Arts and Industry Association, as Thomas Dye just said, because they pulled their, their funding from the Art Institute and then invited Maholi and, well, first Gropius to come here. So um, he, I think there was a, it was really a, a boiling cauldron of all kinds of exciting things happening in graphic design and, and architecture, of course, and other fields related uh, so that once those people came here and started that school, they really had a lot to work with. And for you, Todd, um, you know, as a, as a student that has been spending a good deal of your time working on not only this exhibit, but also the Google Arts and Culture Project. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about that, but my question is, um, what have you uncovered in the research that you've been doing? And like, what, how do you, what do you think the experience would have been like as a student 80 years ago or 81 years ago in comparison to now? Sorry, that, that mic was a little hot. Um, so, um, it was really a privilege to get the chance to spend so much time in the archive. I, I expected to uncover a lot of differences and what I wasn't really prepared for was discovering so many similarities. Um, as the film does a really good job of, of showing, Maholi was such a uh, protean designer. He, he applied himself so well in so many different um, mediums of, of expression, but you know, he was also a, a, an incredibly uh, forward thinker. He was truly a progressive and, and I imagine that um, some of that was uh, the result of the way that he was treated in, in, in Germany, but um, I was surprised to see him leading a conversation that has only, we've only really developed a vocabulary for recently, advocating for things like participatory design, co-design, um, open design, um, really about breaking down barriers that exist between the disciplines um, to create a more inclusive design field. He, he said that everyone is talented um, in an era when women were discriminated against, um, African Americans were discriminated against, Asian Americans were discriminated against, and he welcomed all of those populations to apply themselves um, at the Institute of Design. And, and that was truly uh, one of the most amazing things that I discovered. Um, in terms of the resonances with the education that I'm getting here, uh, the structure has been somewhat uh, consistent. Um, what's really changed is the environment in which the education is, is teaching, is, is happening in. Um, so technology has changed and as a result the curriculum has adapted in order to reflect that change. Um, photography was uh, in Maholi's eyes, the, the coding, what coding is today, it, it was new, it was novel, it was um, un, it was, uh, it had not yet been uh, subject to the rules of art and architecture and he saw that as a potential for creative expression. So um, that's really, I think, what's changed, but for the most part, there's so many uh, strong resonances with what's going on today. Yeah, I mean, I'm glad that you bring that up, the, the piece about sort of equity and inclusivity, um, because I feel like now that's definitely really at the forefront of, of all conversations that we're having around design now. And even something that I feel like has, you know, started to become much more prevalent in the dialogue here at the Institute of Design under Dennis's leadership. Um, and with that, Petter, maybe you can say a word on, you know, some of the, there's the, the women, the role of women in the Bauhaus is, is an interesting um, piece of this story and how did that affect your choices in filmmaking? So, um, Open Darks brought in our director Alyssa Namias, who is right now busy doing our sound mix and color in LA. Um, she is an architect by profession and she has made films in, in the architecture space before. And we thought that it was really, would really interesting to have her um, take a stab at telling the story. And I think with that, she had an interest in thinking about the, the, the untold stories and the unsung heroes that are operating at that time at least kind of in the background. So um, through our you know, close collaboration with Hatola, who is 
um, Maholi's daughter, and who's still alive, living in Ann Arbor, and who'll be here for our premiere in Chicago. We got to know the family, and we got to know the, the um, Maholi's two wives. You know, primarily Sybil, who is Atala's mother, who was very involved in the school, but behind the scenes. No one really knew officially, but she was doing a lot of work. Um, and Hatala, she uses the term handmaidens, but she talks about these, these people that, are, that including uh, Sybil, but also um, Maholi's first wife, Lucia Maholi, who is probably the most well-known photographer that came out of the German Bauhaus. And if you look at any picture from, from the German Bauhaus, most likely it was taken by Lucia. And she was actually the person who taught Maholi how to photograph. And together they learned how to do photograms in the, in the uh, I think it was the Swiss Alps. Um, so these are stories that we thought were interesting to dig deeper into. And I think having Ali Alyssa do that was um, is an, an, an important part of our film. And I've also heard you say that in some ways Hatula is like the, the protagonist in a way and that she's become yeah, the keeper of her father's story. Hatula is our conduit. I mean, she is one of the few people who, 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 was, who was around. You know, she is the living history. She can tell us, paint the pictures in a, in a very vivid way. And thankfully, there's some of the alumni that are still around too. Um, Sumner, um, Sumner, oh, what's his last name? Do you remember? Um, sorry, um, I forget, uh, blank on his last name, but there's, there's a fellow named Sumner who happened to also live in Ann Arbor, who, um, who's in his mid-90s, who studied with Maholi, and who uh, tells very good, in, incredible stories, as well as Bia Takaushi, who's, who studied with Maholi, um, who is close to Chicago now, um, also in her mid-90s. Um, both of them, incredibly, when, when we talk about this time period, now, what are we talking about now, 80 years ago, um, have, they, they, it's like the light just turns on, and they, they uh, have incredibly vivid memories, um, and are very passionate about the school that they went to, and are very passionate about Maholi, and through them and through Hatula, we can, it, it's an important thing for a, for a film like this where a protagonist, protagonist that's been, you know, dead for 70 years plus, to have those kind of people who can help us really um, connect to the character. Actually, I was sort of surprised that you didn't say, um, we, we don't party as hard as they did then, Todd. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so speaking of colorful um, storytelling, Vicky is just a, a wealth of anecdotes of Chicago's design history. And I would love if you could share, you know, with us just a bit of a, a snapshot or a picture of, of your favorite era of Chicago design. Okay. Um, well, I guess my favorite era is the, the 20s through the 50s. Um, and then you, you mentioned untold stories and women. Um, I had uh, a few of my own that I, I would love to learn more about. And alas, um, in, uh, sources are few and far between sometimes for various reasons things have gotten thrown out. So um, one woman I'm particularly interested in is in Norma Staley, the woman who headed the Association of Arts and Industries from 1922 to 50, 50 something, um, and she's the one who wrote the letter to Gropius and to Maholi to, to bring them here, but she was agitating for 15 years before that to join art and industry in Chicago, and so she was really interesting to me. And then for the people who were at the school, Marley Ehrman is a, 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 of interest to me. She, Maholi invited her from Germany to come here to head the weaving workshop, and then after his passing, the weaving workshop was terminated um, by later managers, and so she came out to Oak Park, and I live in Oak Park, and she started teaching weaving there, and she started a store. She started a, a home, in, uh, you know, a store that sold modern design in Oak Park. That was really interesting. And then um, the exhibit up there has a few pictures of Beatrice Takeuchi, and that's something that is of great interest to me, is the, we hear a lot about the Central Europeans that started this school, but I'm very interested in the high percentage of Japanese students who flock to the school after being released from the internment camps. In Beatrice's case, she spent very little time there. It was very, very lucky for her that she had 
a teacher from her former school in Seattle who wrote letters and agitated for her to be released. So she only spent a few months, unlike others who were there for a few years. So she came to the Bauhaus school when it was uh, above the Chez Paris, uh, and um, her memoirs are at the Archive of American Art at Smithsonian. And she paints such a vivid picture of those wonderful, exciting years to be in that building on Ontario Street. Um, to have the, the waiters from the Chez Perry bringing leftover food to the students working through the night, and um, how, in her case, she was surrounded by people speaking languages she didn't quite understand, the, the Europeans, and she said it was a breath of fresh air for someone like me, an American who was interred, and to be brought, to be allowed to study here and, you know, dispel all those notions of, of what she had learned in art school before and start fresh and new and learn from the way art was being taught here and art visual perception. And she said all the bounds of racism and all those other things have, are not here that she had experienced in her life. It was, if, if you, can, um, you can download Beatrice Tacchiucci's memoirs. I, I highly recommend it. It's, it's really powerful to read how she described life in that building. And she does that in the film too. She's in there. Mm -hmm. Yes, she's still with us, thank goodness, so she's in the film. Um, now, what was your other question? I've already forgotten. I think, that, I think you, I think I asked oh, you to stories. bring stories. Yes, yeah. one more your story. Favorite story. You asked me to bring the Dove soap bar, so I have that. But um, uh, also in his 90s is Don Dimmitt. And I visited with him several times in Chicago before they, he and his wife moved to Arizona. And... Um, he described when he started school, it was a, uh, shortly before Maholi's passing, it was um, probably the fall of 46 when he started school. And unlike other students who were being there, were, were there on the GI Bill, um, they meant, that meant when they were in registration line, they had no money to pay for their education because someday, somehow, the school was going to get paid back by the federal government. So they just had little chits, little pieces of paper that they were on the GI Bill and they were paying for their tuition that way. And when he came up, he grew up in Wheaton or Glen Ellen or something like that and took the train every day downtown to go to school, um, also on Ontario Street. <laughs> um, and so when he got into the line, he had cash and he put cash down. And Maholi looked at Sybil and said, Sybil, we're going to eat tonight. <laughs> so that was pretty fun that, that they, you know, it was hand to mouth for them to try quite literally to be paying the bills with the tuition that was coming in. So um, Don had wonderful stories of his, his time here. Do you want me to talk about the soap? Is it later? Okay. Sure. So, so Vicky has a prop. Yeah. <laughs> Show it to We have this story about the Dove soap bar in the film, and I asked her and Petter to to tell us a little bit about it as, as this audience, I think, would enjoy this one. So this is it. So everybody knows this, right? I think this is a, um, probably the most lasting evidence of how students were taught under Maholi and his foundation class on how to uh, perceive the world and how to work with materials. And so if you saw the Art Institute exhibit a few years ago, there was a whole um, array of little things in wood like this that were the result of the hand sculpture class, where students had to carve something that felt good in the hand. Well, with that experience, seniors um, in the, 19, the graduating class of 1952, so that would have been the spring of 52, let's say, um, they, had a uh, they were given a, a corporate sponsored project, at, as students do today as well. Now, this, of course, is after Maholi's passing, but nonetheless, the, the, that was part of the foundation class, that exercise. So um, they had a sponsored class, and the uh, Lever Brothers was the sponsor. Their factory was in Hammond, Indiana, and at that time, Chicago was just factories everywhere. It was, a, it was a peak manufacturing time, so students could get the benefit of visiting factories and learning from experience of seeing machines on the line. So the students uh, were trekked out to Hammond, Indiana, to the Leavers Brothers plant, which at that time was a, now uh, the largest manufacturer of soap. And soap was extruded uh, just like lumber. It would come out as a plank. Um, um, the material that was the soap material. And so each student was, you know, given a couple feet of this plank, like a piece of lumber, to bring back to school and to carve and to try to find a shape that would fulfill the client's assignment, which was to create 
a bar of soap that would not lose its brand identity when sitting in a little puddle of water. And so they came up with this, and the, the, the wooden model carved by Don Dimmitt's classmate, Bill Veer, is at the muse museum uh, da, uh, over there on uh, North Avenue, Chicago History Museum, has the actual model. It was a trio of students, Don Dimmitt, Bill Levere, and um, blanking on the third fellow's name. Um, and so that was their, their senior year project. Alas, they got no, no royalties out of it, and after the school got its grant money, I don't think the school got any royalties out of it either. But I think as far as product design goes, this is the most lasting piece of evidence. And, and certainly, um, you know, when Maholi made the transition from, from Europe to the United States, I mean, it was, he physically embodied that, and Liz Siegel did a wonderful job of expressing this in a talk that she gave here a couple years ago that Jeff Mao put together, but he literally wore like the worker's suit, like kind of to show his um, allegiance with communism and socialism, um, and when he came to Chicago, he wore a proper suit for his fundraising efforts, and I think that's covered quite a bit in the film. Um, I want to give the rest of the audience here an opportunity to ask some questions of our panelists. So I'm going to go ahead and pass a mic around. I'll just take and do this one again. Sorry, what's happening? Oh, is that? Oh, perfect. Okay, great. Mm. I think our first person is this gentleman. It's not on. Oh, boom. Hi. Um, just a very simple question. At what point in time does your film end? At what point in time does your film end? When does it end? Um, well, there, is, there isn't a specific date that it ends. Um, our focus is Mahole's time, the 10 years that Mahole is in Chicago. That is our focus. But we do talk about the school's development a little bit after Mahole's death. And I think specifically we get into um, to the photography that happens after um, after Mahola's death. I mean, that's really when the t photography department takes off and um, the school has, has, has really important uh, place in the, in the history of photography in this country. So we get into that, and that, so that stretches into the 50s and into the 60s even. But we, do, we don't really talk about now. What we do talk about is how his work is relevant today. <laughs> So we're using some examples of pr practitioners who are working today who are you know, greatly influenced by Maholi's work and, you can, and how you know, what his thoughts and his ideas and his approach to working 100 years ago are still relevant. And I would just add to that, you know, particularly his pedagogical contribution. So this idea of experimentation as a way of learning and as a way of know knowing and making his thinking is incredibly, um, you know, relevant still today in the teachings of the Institute of Design. If I can add to that, um, this is what Maholi wrote of the pedagogical outlook of the school. And when I read it, I literally just, I was so amazed because it sounded like it could be the same mission of the school today. We know that art itself cannot be taught our task is therefore to contrive a new system of education which along with a specialized training in science and technique leads to a thorough awareness of fundamental human needs and universal outlook. Thus our concern is to develop a new type of designer able to face all kind of requirements not because they are prodigies but because they have the right method of approach. Upon this premise we have built our program. And really, what's changed is just one of emphasis. The, the methods, the rigor, the discipline has been, has been stressed, and new methods have been developed to respond to the current technological conditions that we're in.
I actually didn't hear. It. Can you repeat the question? Uh, the question was, what were, what are the most salient and um, monumental developments in social sciences that have influenced design today? Is that is that without the question? Um, it's a great question. Um, I think. Well, I was going to bring up, I was going to kind of, I hope this is going to answer your question. I was going to piggyback off of what you were saying about the hand models because I'm, I'm glad you brought those up. They're actually included in the, uh, we have some photos of them upstairs. We have Maholi with a hand model. Um, but that was a method that emphasized uh, human, human comfort um, above all, and it's very much applicable to the human-centered design that has become more reflective of the social concerns. Um, many of our classes here include behavioral economics and, and um, uh, Daniel, uh, I can never get his last name right, but the thinking fast and slow. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, thank you. Um, but so the, the context uh, used to be more, people were more interested in technology. You know, the, the uh, arts and industry society, they, they brought, they were excited about the idea of bringing art and technology together. Increasingly, design is drawing on more multidisciplinary approaches, including social sciences, economics, um, and, and so it's, it's reflective of those developments. I don't know that I can, will speak to exactly which ones, but it's considering them all. So the d discipline is becoming much more uh, multidisciplinary. And also the Institute of Design is known, you know, for pioneering the notion of human-centered design, meaning basically understanding the um, unmet needs and wants of, of people and designing for that, which comes from, you know, ethnographic research and um, deeply understanding human beings. I just wanted to add something to that. Could you hold this? One thing I couldn't say before because I was holding the microphone is that exactly what you said, the students watch people washing their hands. And a typical bar of soap would always end up being an oval. And when they saw that people were actually holding their hands sideways instead of like this to wash their hands, this shape is what emerged. So I don't think they used the word ethnography then, but what we do now, what, I, what designers do, not me, but um, is watch people do what they're doing. <laughs> and um, observation is, is really the, the key to it all. And, you know, another application of that same thing was developing a, a handset. That, that was used for a telephone. Um, I think that was Nolan Rhodes. It never, yeah. it never happened then, but it, you know, years later, something like the princess phone was able to evolve from that idea. Do we have time for one more question? If there is one. All right, well, if there are no more questions, I think we can do one more comment, Dennis. So uh, I want to thank the panelists. One second. Um. Uh, I want to thank the panelists, uh, Ashley, for the leading the panel, and the panelists uh, to talk about it. And this is a little t ID gift. I have all that stuff. And, and I hope you can, uh, you can please join us uh, for the reception upstairs, uh, where the panelists will be there as well, and many of our students and faculty, and we can continue the conversation about the new Bauhaus and the relevance for it today. Thank you for coming, and please join us upstairs. Thank you. Thank you.